Imagine, a podcast series by Imagine Theatre. Hello again and welcome to episode 84 of the Just Imagine podcast as we continue our occasional series looking at the most popular pantomime titles by concentrating on Mother Goose. For more information, go to their website at www.imaginetheatre.co.uk. In the last episode, I was joined by the daughter of the legendary musical director, arranger and composer Paul Burnett. Don't worry if you missed that or any of the other previous episodes, they are all still available. And if you've missed them, so far we've been talking with celebrities, backstage team members, practitioners and academics about how pantomime is produced, its history and its future. So make sure you check them all out where you normally get your podcasts from and don't forget to subscribe to the series so that you don't miss any future episodes. Well, this time we're going to take a look at another popular pantomime title, Mother Goose. And I'm delighted to say I've been joined by Imagine's joint CEO, Steve Bowden. Hello there, Martin. And the Senior Curator of Modern and Contemporary Performance at the Victoria and Albert Museum, Curator of the National Database of Pantomime Performance, and Founder and Coordinator of National Panto Day, amongst other things, Simon Sladen. Hi, Martin. Now, I said most popular pantomime titles, Simon, and Mother Goose may not be one of the most popular titles these days, but it has one of the richest histories, doesn't it? Oh, the history is so, so wonderful. So, I mean, we can really chase it back to the first English translation of Charles Perrault's The Tale of Mother Goose. That's 1729, but 1806, we see her make her pantomime debut. And that's in a production of Harlequin and Mother Goose or The Golden Egg. Joseph Grimaldi, the famous clown, is in it as Squire Bugle. And Mother Goose isn't the dame as we know her at this point. She's a mystical figure, a magical old crone. And she teaches the squire a lesson. Now, we don't see this today by raising his dear departed wife from the grave and giving him quite a fright. Now, <laughs> that shows important for a number of reasons. So we see Mother Goose as a title come on. It's also credited as cemented the English country village as a popular pantomime setting. And it enjoyed a revival in New York in 1831. But the Mother Goose, as we know it today, really has its roots in the 1902 production at Theatre or Drury Lane with, of course, Dan Leno. A, a humbled and contented Mother Goose is tested when she adopts a golden egg-laying goose. And as her wealth grows, of course, she seeks beauty. She's transformed by bathing in a magic pool. And as the wonderful fairy Heartsease explains, while she's content, the goose will stay. But when she grumbles, it will fly away. And audiences, loved Dan Lido's transformation from this worker mother goose to this beautified uh, uh, amazing uh, individual on the stage and it, it, the stage described that mother goose as a veritable creation a study that tempts one to see it again and again probably one of the most famous dames playing a role which was written for him and really exemplifying and cementing the transformation as key to that narrative as well as a tale about good and bad, which today you can adapt so many ways, which is just wonderful. Yeah, and of course, it has its story roots in folk tales, and there are a number of different areas where uh, the story of Mother Goose could have come from. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we could we could look way, way back at the everyman tale, or we might go way, way back and think even even some of those earlier uh, uh, stories, or we could go way back to, to Greece and think about, you know, good versus bad and that morality which absolutely also has some echoes or synergies with religious morals as well about where you turn about you know beauty being on the in the inside and so it is a really multi-layered tale which today is having new layers built on it because if we think about where may we see some of that behaviors or characteristics or hiding behind something or wanting to be beautiful or famous of course social media talent shows on television they've all been used as reference points in contemporary productions now, I said, Steve, it's not as popular as it has been in the past. I think, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the last time Imagine did Mother Goose, I was Mother Goose. Yes, you're absolutely right. And it doesn't come up very often in the canon of pantomimes that we produce. And I think that's sometimes down to the actual marketability of the title in a kind of brutally commercial way, which is obviously a consideration because the title hasn't got that sort of Disney edge or isn't as uh, as in po the popular psyche as a lot of other tales are, people aren't sure what it is that they're coming to see. And therefore, theatres resist 
when they're purely looking from a commercial point of view, anything that promotes uncertainty. Certainly when we've done Mother's Goose, and you're absolutely right, when we did it with you and we've done it with Ian Lachlan uh, and we've done it um, with Steve Wren up in Eden Court, when we've run it, we've run it with established dames where audiences tend to come back to see the panto because they know the performers that are going to be playing that title role. And therefore they're a lot more open to being tested with new titles. I really enjoy Mother Goose. And I guess as a dame, Martin, you enjoyed playing the role because it does offer far more than the conventional dame in pantomime because you're front and center of the narrative arc. Yeah. And it's got certain elements that are not in other uh, pantomimes the good versus evil is there with the demon king but the moral is very strong and of course you've got a goose that yeah. lays golden eggs that's right and you care about the dame as a central character and you care about the the uh, predicament that she is being placed in you know she is being tested she's being tested by good and she's being tested by evil and she makes various calls throughout the pantomime to weigh up the options and i think you know uh, as Simon was saying it's interesting to relate that to modern day experiences that that everybody is is having put upon them particularly through social media and you're constantly being tested as to what is right and wrong and what you're uh, uh, and and your own moral judgments and i think it's good for us to remind children that there are rights on uh, uh, that they are considering at all times and, and mother goose is a good tale to tell that of course a skin character such as the goose is great because it also has magical powers and it can lay golden eggs we see a goose laying golden eggs potentially in jack and the beanstalk as well so it's not an unusual character in pantomime but again the fact that the goose can actually play a central role makes it a really interesting panto. Lots of room for special effects, Simon. But you said about the relevance in the 21st century, the pool of beauty is almost like having a filter on your iPhone, isn't it? Totally. I mean, it absolutely is that. And it is, I suppose, you know, pantomime does play into some of those maybe base feelings, base emotions. I think most of the narratives about finding yourself or going on a personal journey, as well as maybe a quest adventure. Um, and Mother Goose really plays to that. And actually it's really tough for the performer playing Mother Goose because you know when you've done Mother Goose well, because the audience are gonna boo you in the second act when you, you know, you've given Priscilla away in, in exchange for beautification. Some productions, her her children or the friends don't recognize her so great is the transformation and it's funny because there have been so many great dames of course including yourself martin that have played that role uh, famously matthew kelly played it as patsy from ab fab and he, he was really thinking about how do we make this relevant today and he, he thought patsy from ab fab is great because here's a woman who thinks she's beautiful but she's actually just a hideous individual who goes around like that um stanley baxter's dame transformed whether he played mother goose during the 50s into a rock and roll teenager sort of a grumpy out out there that person so it's great to be able to relate it to the time um and also i suppose it's the biggest one of the biggest rewards at the end when she does apologize and it teaches us as steve was saying you know our audiences that are watching it that things might get difficult you may make bad mistakes but actually family friends can bring you through that and it's about making amends sometimes you need to apologize but importantly, there is a moral and a message, isn't it? That's all part of life's learning. And you will sometimes be tempted and you will not always have the right decision, but you can still move forward. And it, it, it's about learning within that. I mean, the other aspect that keeps it fresh and thinking about technology, you know, mobile phones, filters and stuff. Uh, some of the other great things that I wish I would have seen in 1957, Richmond Theatre, didn't fly Mother Goose to Gooseland with Priscilla or in a hot air balloon, um, Sputnik was chosen because Sputnik <laughs> had just been launched. And we see this technology coming in quite frequently to, to Mother Goose. Of course, sometimes it is also set in a, a circus. It's got so much opportunity for creativity within it. Yeah, and the climax of the story, Simon, is that, is that uh, final scene in Goose Court or Goose Land where she pleads to get Priscilla back and uh, apologises for the error of her ways. Absolutely. And whilst, you know, Mother Goose is often referred to as maybe the Hamlet of the Dames role for the, you know, excuse the pun, don't excuse the pun, or, you know, one of the biggest roles you can have, as Steve said, that skin role of the Goose is also so key within it because it's got to convey real emotion. 
and inside a, a skin or some of you some of your listeners might know them as um mascot style characters uh, if you think about the pantomime cow we don't see the performers inside imagine the person with a goose costume on it's all in the slight fluttering of the eyelids or the movement of the beak or you know today it's very rare that a performer was specialized in that role for many many years as skin performers used to in these iron cages that had you know real feathers around them and were really heavy but that is also wonderful that relationship that the audience have with the goose they're on the goose's side as well and you get such a great sense of family from that it's one of the pantos that often if it's done extremely well it is a roller coaster of emotions we all sort of think oh wouldn't that be great to you know have all that money from the gold and then have a bit of an uplift and then you think oh would that bring happiness and it, it, it's one that really makes you think and 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 celebrate i suppose celebrate community steve when you're actually producing any panto and mother goose is a good example what are your considerations we said it's maybe not as popular as some of the other titles so what are you considering before even looking at mother goose i think we would consider the venue and the reputation of the separate central characters are we working in a venue where we have actors who are repeat performers is the dame a repeat performer is there a demand and an expectation and an acceptance from the audience to try something different, which is obviously from a producer's point of view, really satisfying. So we make a kind of uh, quantitative decision on those elements. And we talk to the theatre and we say, we'd like to try this title. Interestingly, Mother Goose performs particularly well for us in Scotland. And I think, I think that's because there are a greater number of dames in Scotland who are more resident in theatres and who have been there a number of years. And also I think the story just works in Scotland, they they don't necessarily see their pantomimes in the same way as perhaps an English audience. They follow narrative and they follow relationship and emotion in pantomime in a much more dynamic way than we do down south. They're a very interactive style of show. But I think once we've decided commercially whether the show and the cast will work together, a lot of the other considerations are on the goose the actor that plays the goose, you know, one of our great panto exponents in this country is Nigel Ellicott. He cut his teeth in his early pantomime careers playing a goose, I believe, down at the Belgrade in Coventry mm -hmm. and at several other venues after that. And it, it's exactly as Simon said, it's a, such an incredibly important part for you to care from an audience's point of view about it. The, the, the fi finding an actor who is able to do that sort of role is probably one of the key considerations that we have followed by the scale of the show and the key journeys and the key moments, how Priscilla flies, how do we get our cast to um, Cloudland or do we follow a narrative that takes us down to the demon's lair, which is also a narrative thread of Act Two. Act Two of Mother Goose offers up so many opportunities uh, for staging it that you actually have a, a, a blank page to decide down what route you take that story arc. And in terms of special effects, you know, in terms of sets, costumes and so on, there's an opportunity to fly, perhaps. I think the Pool of Beauty was more of a waterfall when we did it, but there are all sorts of things you can do with that as well. There are, and obviously in exploring the world of digital screens and screen-based tech, again, far greater opportunities present themselves. And it's it's like everything. It, it, producing Panto in the way that we do at Imagine and a lot of other commercial producers is you have to try and forecast your return on your investment over how many seasons will you recover the costs investing into this level of tech. But uh, the opportunities that the tech presents itself are what drives audiences to come back year on year and to try something different. So, yeah, I think the, 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 the opportunities in Mother Goose, you've got two key moments. You've got that transformation at the end of Act One when she transforms into the character that she thinks she wants to be and then you've got a second opportunity for a transformation on the journey to redemption by whatever journey that is in terms of the popularity simon is the biggest problem partly that it hasn't been done by disney but more realistically that nobody actually really knows the story Do you know what? i'm going to say something quite controversial because i think <laughs> it's interesting how we think about popularity if we look at the number of productions of mother goose it's never been the most popular and hasn't changed but it goes back to what Steve was saying about it is a role that when you have a dame at a particular venue or a very prominent dame John Inman did it for years and years and years with Barbara Newman as his, as his goose that will get an audience in and it is about that hook isn't it? about how to bring it in it's funny because if you say the 
Mother Goose, most people might think the collection of, of stories or, or, or nursery rhymes. But I think people today are, and we're seeing it from the industry more and more, the portfolio of titles is expanding. And I think it's great that Mother Goose, which people might not really know much about, is being included, but it is often seen as that pinnacle of a of a dame's career or, or, or land landing that role is like you've really made it. I mean, let's look at some of these people that have played Mother Goose, Norman Evans, Nellie Wallace, Jack Tripp, Hilda Baker, Ronnie Corbett, Elaine C. Smith, Christopher Biggins, Brett Kaler, Clive Rowe, and even Elton John, uh, a benefit performance where John Gilgood was the Goose King in 1984. So whilst most people might not have heard of it, I think certainly pantomime goers are aware of its it's really important status. It may be done more rarely than other titles, but there's a reason because there's something very special about that, that it's a it's a moment where you are honouring the craft of the dame. You're giving them that extra depth of performance that might not be naturally evident, even though they will give it, but might not naturally be evident in, in other plays. And as Steve said, it's a tough one. You know, getting somebody to play the goose either in a skin or today, as we're seeing more and more of, as a walking, talking goose with an exposed face that can be one of those characters and deliver some of that emotion and narrative through speaking English. That's a tough one. And you do have to, I think, work much harder textually on the script to deliver those narrative points. We've spoken so many times about pantomime being the first time children will go to the theatre. If you ask them what the story of Aladdin was or what Cinderella was or Sleeping Beauty even, they would know Jack and the Beanstalk. But if you ask most children the story of Mother Goose, they simply wouldn't have a clue, would they? No, and I think that potentially is a, a problem with some of the parents as well. And at the end of the day, the parents are the people who make the financial commitment to take the family to the pantomime and in the you know when you're looking at pantomimes and choice of titles in venues and you've decided as a family that you'd like to go to the pantomime if your local panto is a title that you're less familiar with but one that's perhaps five or ten minutes away further is a title that you recognize that will be a driver in the decision of where to go so i think as as we've identified the choice of casting is really important in that title so the future of this as a title simon you've already talked about its relevance in the 21st century steve already mentioned how new technology can help simon has it got a rich future do you think yeah i think it absolutely does and actually although i provocatively said you know it's never been the most dominant of forms we are seeing more productions year on year in the last maybe five years or so and that's partly because it's becoming a bit of an anniversary title so if there's a venue that's experiencing an anniversary maybe of the building or of a dame or of a of a certain celebration or festival it seems to be a great way to to center that i think because of the spotlight that's been on it some of these really key dames in the contemporary practice and some of those venues other people are going, hey, this is a great story and we can be really confident in in delivering this. I think its relationship with technology is going to get stronger. I think we're going to see the Goose character becoming more and more integral as a speaking character to maybe add to the comedy level. We are seeing productions that are doing away with the romance side of it as being sort of the family and, and their journey. And I think I look very much forward because as we've discussed, what a great show for spectacle, water, sky, <laughs> you know, into the depths of the earth. There are very few that get that. And I actually think that makes it exciting because when the audience don't have such a strong affinity to it and they're not expecting the Disney characters jump onto the pantomime stage, they will allow that imagination to absolutely run wild. They have no expectations and that in a way can be even more rewarding and special which is why I think we are seeing it as one of those sort of anniversary celebration titles. And Steve, in terms of the technology, we've mentioned uh, digital screens and so on, but puppetry is very um, integral part of pantomime these days, animatronics and so on. So, you know, the sky's the limit, really. There's something very exciting and very satisfying, both as a producer and as an audience member, to have those moments, uh, as Simon's just described, where you suddenly see something that is not what you're expecting or your preconceived ideas are limited and you're not trying to prescribe or, or deliver some, to somebody's expectations. And I think, you know, what's exciting about all Panto titles is how we can keep these stories fresh, what levels of tech we can bring to them. And the idea of the skin character becoming a, a walking, talking, living, breathing, interactive performer who does dialogue with the audience, whether it's to the ears of other characters or whether it's purely to the ears of the fair 
vary in the audience is quite an exciting device and i think it's it's breaking down those barriers of what we've done before and pushing them forward which which keeps us going as panto producers you know i remember when we first created the animatronic giants 20 odd years ago uh, and then kind of developed that in the kind of pegasus flying horses there's a great opportunity for the sort of tech that's used in film and used in other, you know, theme park worlds to become prevalent in pantomime. Often it's just about bringing those worlds together and having a uh, probably ultimately deep enough pocket to make those production choices at the outset and and to commit to being able to deliver them and knowing that if you're going to create a brand new production of Mother Goose, that you've got enough venues where you can place that product for years to come to recover your uh, investment and and as all businesses have to do to return a profit to allow continual investment in future titles and simon is there any more we can do with the story to make it more relevant in the 21st century more inclusive more diversity and so on yeah interesting question martin because there have been lots of productions which have done this so uh, the tron um in glasgow johnny mcknight his production had mother goose's son uh, actually fell in love with the villain's son. And there was a great playing out there of, does does the son of the villain want to be evil? They don't know any different. And there was some learning there and a lovely romance blossomed there. Of course, I think, as we, as we said earlier, that notion about being yourself, self-empowerment, and, um, uh, you know, it's difficult, isn't it? We, we see advertising everywhere, whether that's on the phones, whether that's on telly, it's saying about this is how you should look, this is how you should be. Well, Mother Goose is a title that absolutely says, be who you want to be, don't let that be prescribed, don't get sucked in by that. And I think that moral is so strong that it can really help um, w- with that, with our, with our present day. But that notion and ability for being inclusive especially because you think of those plot points where the audience are the moral compass you know should i sell priscilla um you know do you think i'm beautiful i mean it's that's so empowering and i think we we're always the industry's working very hard to to be more inclusive and think about some of those way in narratives whether that is um a, a relationship between um same-sex characters whether that's ensuring that the casting is representative of its local audience and and wider audience. And the other aspect, which I've been thinking a lot recently, is about some of those environmental aspects that we're thinking about more of these days, our relationship with animals, about aspects such as um, uh, animal cruelty or animals being part of the family. That's something that we're seeing pantomimes think a lot of jack and the beanstalk a lot of a lot of productions are now thinking about that environmental aspect of that about looking after the planet and of course looking after each other and being kind to each other is exactly what the victorians were talking about in that about not just using animals for giving us money and then being done with them you know they're part of the family they give us so much care we love them uh, we, they have they often have human names so i think there's a lot that reflects society and can inform society and will continue to do that whether that's a celebration of the relationship between humans and animals or maybe exposing cultural anxieties about technology such as space travel or who knows ai i mean things like that that make people appear differently pantomime but particularly mother goose is going to be the vehicle that we see that and it's interesting the relationship with animals i think was a key feature of um, ian mckellen and john bishop's uh, mother goose a couple of years ago in terms of the venues though steve um, obviously for both producers and venues it's a really important time of the year you have to make sure you get it right are venues perhaps more reluctant to take that risk on a title like mother goose it's a, It's always further up the list of concerns that you are faced with. It was always there, but it's certainly higher. But we also point out the great strengths and opportunities that arise. You have a greater freedom to explore all those themes that, that Simon was just talking about. And that can be quite liberating. And when you know you can deliver a very strong, good production of it, because most importantly, you know you've got the right actor playing the role of Mother Goose, then actually the benchmark and the lynch and the, and the stepping stone to the following year's production is actually raised because people go, wow, that was that delivered a greater uh, experience than I was necessarily expecting. Yes, of course, I'll come back next year and see what there is on offer in the theatre then. And I think that's what it's all about. It's all about using the panto, as venues often do, as a cornerstone of theatre programming, both the subsequent pantomime, but also other things that are happening. And I think the role of Mother Goose is going to be a lot stronger 
than it has been as a title because there are other titles that people are also struggling to stage. Dick Whittington is a very uh, is a very unusual title for similar reasons. It has great opportunities, but our canon of titles is perhaps sometimes contracting. And what we're trying to do is to go, there are other titles that we should be exploring. And Mother Goose is one of those, providing that we can find the right team and the right production style that won't jeopardise any commercial success. Of course, you've been looking at new titles in the last couple of years. Um, Treasure Island, um, Little Mermaid, Robin Hood is back again this year. So do you think Mother Goose might come back into the imagined canon in the next few years? Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to. I think we're looking at where we have uh, continuity of performers, particularly dames, and where we have the opportunity to develop a new production. Excellent. And that's a nice positive note to end on as well. As always, it's been a fascinating discussion. So Steve Bowden and Simon Sladen, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Much, Martin. And that's it for now. But you may like to know that in the previous 83 episodes, we've discussed a number of other pantomime titles, ranging from Aladdin and Cinderella to Dick Whittington and Snow White. So make sure you check them out and subscribe through your favourite podcast app so that you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, join me, Martin Ballard, next time for episode 85, when I'll be joined by the stage, television and film actor, Nathan Guy. Thank you for listening to the latest edition of Just Imagine, the podcast series from Imagine Theatre. And you can find out more by going to www.imagintheatre.co.uk. 